Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from May 9th to the 15th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos and then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. But we're going to start with this one from Tom Angles. This is probably the newest poll that we have that tells us again what we already know, that there's tremendous support for ending cannabis prohibition. But just to relay, this is as of May 13th. A new poll finds that 70% of Americans want to either legalize cannabis nationwide or at least end federal prohibition so that states can enact reform. And across every demographic, only a minority wants to maintain criminalization across the board. And so while this poll was conducted by YouGov, fortunately it is more new data telling us what we already know, that an overwhelming majority of Americans want cannabis prohibition to come to an end. And if Congress was functioning properly, they would be paying attention to this and working in the will of the American people. Unfortunately, they haven't. However, they have lots of time from now until November to do something if they want to improve their chances of getting reelected. While we move on to this one from Cannabis Business Times, as Missouri medical cannabis sales top 335.8 million since launching their program in October of 2020. And so you keep in mind that Missouri is still a medical only market and this does not include adult use. However, from my understanding, there are efforts to put the question of legalization on the ballot in November uh, in the upcoming election. So that would obviously be beneficial for those in Missouri, but total medical Medical cannabis sales have reached 335.8 million in April, bringing that cumulative value up roughly 12.3% from March. So that's a big jump. Obviously, 420 helped, even if it's just a medical only market, but seems like growth is increasing as total sales are now up 773.3% from this time last year when they were resting around 38.5 million in April 2021, according to data from the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. And I'll show you a chart next that we'll get to. It's pretty eye opening, but since the program's launched in October 2020, the MDHSS has issued over 185,000 medical cannabis cards to patients and caregivers, according to a press release from the Missouri Medical Cannabis Trade Association. And just to add that Missouri is also working to broaden participation within its cannabis industry this year through its 2022 ballot initiative. And so just for more info, the state would create a new licensing category reserved for small businesses, very beneficial to smaller mom and pop individuals, minority entrepreneurs, to add a minimum of 144 licensed facilities to the existing 378 that are already supplying. So the new licensing category would also allow operators to both cultivate the plant and manufacture cannabis products according to the release. And so I'm not sure if this is just cultivation uh, versus opening dispensaries, but obviously that is good because it will help expand the program in Missouri. And just to show you this, this is the cumulative growth of uh, dispensary sales. And so where they say last year at this point in time, April 2021, they were sitting at 38.45. Look at how quickly these sales have grown as they slowly do expand the market and allow more access to legal supply. And so this is great to see, and so hopefully Missouri can get that question to legalize on the ballot. On to this one from Florida. We look at the Office of Medical Cannabis Use, looking at this past week from May 9th to the 13th, and we do see that Liberty Health Sciences, which is backed by Air Wellness, uh, did open a new dispensary in Claremont. If we take a look at the qualified patient count, uh, Florida's qualified patient count did increase to 719,366, which represents an increase of 2,868 patients week over week. So good to see the growth continue there. Well, if we take a look at dispensations for May 6th to 12th, we can see all the MSOs operating in the state, the number of milligrams of THC that they sold this past week, milligrams of CBD, and ounces of smokable flour. And so if you invest in any MSOs, you can check week over week to see whether they're selling more or less and maintaining their market share in this very competitive state. But on to some news as Trulief starts their year with a record first quarter 2022 results. So just to recap some of the easy highlights, record revenue of 318.3 million, up 64% year over year and 4% sequentially. And so this obviously includes as they are rolling along and integrating the harvest assets that they bought last year. First quarter, 2022 cash flow from operations of 45.1 million and a cash balance of 267 million. While lastly, industry leading US retail network of 162 dispensaries after the acquisition, supported by over 4 million square feet of cultivation and processing capacity, up 95% and 93% year over year respectively as of March 31st, 2022. So I was looking forward to this. And so you can just pause to read the financial highlights if you want a quick read through um, of, the, of the bullet points. 
and also same thing for the Q1 2022 uh, operating highlights. You can pause to read if you want to read the bullet points uh, and then recent events that they've done since the end of Q1. And so there's some management commentary here. And main thing I want to highlight though is the financial guidance. So what are we looking for for the next 12 months looking out just based on the fact that certain states that might have launched sooner than later didn't and also the fact that TrueLeaf isn't actually in New Jersey or New York. They're playing a bit of a different game. And so what are they anticipating for the rest of 2022? TrueLeaf is reiterating 2022 guidance with expected revenue in the range of 1.3 billion to 1 1.4 billion and adjusted EBITDA in the range of 450 to 500 million. And so based on the company's current forecasts, it, it expects to realize improved performance in the second half of 2022 relative to the first half of 2022. And this is very much in line with the other MSOs and how they've been saying, um, you know, over time, we've realized that Croptober severely affects Q4 and Q1. However, that allows for, you know, more substantial performance on their earnings reports in Q2 and Q3. So that's something that we got to keep in the back of our minds in our toolbox. And remember that going forward, if we want to continue to play these cycles, over the next coming decade. And so, but now one of the financial highlights, just a quick walkthrough of the main things that I'm paying attention to as a long-term TrueLeaf shareholder. And so obviously if we look at this time last year, March 31st, 2021, this was when TrueLeaf was a single entity by itself before acquiring Harvest Health and Recreation. And so obviously now they are making a lot more revenue, more gross profit, but they're spending more on operating expenses because they have to integrate that sale with their own. And so let's see how they compare year over year with the addition of that uh, acquisition. Revenue up to 318.3 million, up from 193.8 million. So that represents a change of 64% and 4% quarter over quarter as well. They don't show it here in Q4 last quarter, truly did bring in 305.3 million. And I believe that was the first quarter with the new entity brought in. And so I'm just happy to share that their revenues are growing up despite the growth that we're not seeing from the other MSOs. And worth noting that they did actually beat Cureleaf in the most recent quarter here. So it seems like Leaf is looking like number one as of right now. And for a gross profit of 178.2 million up from 135.3 million, again, at this time last year when Leaf had not acquired Harvest yet, uh, representing a 32% increase. And so I am happy to see them getting their gross margins back up, uh, up to 56%, uh, not nearly close to the 70% before the uh, the purchase, but that's going to take time for them to get back up there. I have no doubt though that with Kim's management, they can get back up there with an adjusted gross profit of 185.4 million, up from 137.9. So adjusted gross profit margins up to 58%. While the new entity's operating expenses did see a pretty big jump, uh, especially compared to last year. So while it looks bad at 138%, keep in mind that last year, Trulieve was spending 62.7 million operating expenses as a single entity alone, and that made up 32% of revenue. Well, this time around, obviously, when you integrate the two companies, you got to spend money now in order to not spend it in the future, and you got to comb through all their assets and liabilities you know, and try and keep what's good, but then get rid of what's not good and spend as little as money as possible doing so while also trying to sell and make some money back. Uh, so this time around, it does make up 47% of revenue. And so not ideal, but I think that will decrease over time. And so for that reason as well, net income loss this quarter of 32 million uh, compared to last year where they had a positive net income of 30.1. But I do think this is temporary. And at this time next year, we likely will not see, um, you know, such high operating expenses and net income losses as the company is better integrated by that time. But all in all, I think it was a very solid quarter for truly even while they might not beat Cureleaf in total revenue by the end of 2022. It is good to see that they managed to surprise the other MSOs, and it seems like Trulief is the revenue leader right now. And so I'm going to play some of this interview from Yahoo Finance as we've got CEO Kim Rivers on the outlook for Trulief's profitability. We are absorbing and digesting the largest cannabis transaction to date, and that's a good way to put it. So I'm just going to let Kim take it away for a bit. Uh, yeah, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic quarter. I have to make one slight correct. We're in 11 states now, and it was hard to keep up. But um, yeah, we had a fantastic quarter up sequentially, 65% uh, year over year, 4% uh, for the quarter, uh, strong top, top line growth, but I think even more importantly, strong uh, cash flow generation from operations, $45 million there. Uh, and really just, again, um, optimizing assets across the platform and really, uh, really proud of the team. Record revenue, but lost 32 million in the quarter. How close is True Leaf to being profitable? Nothing compared to LPs. So um, we are absorbing and digesting a very large transaction uh, that we closed in October, October 1st. Uh, it was actually the largest cannabis transaction to date. Uh, so we had 55% improvement quarter over quarter on that loss number. And the loss was attributable to one-time and non-recurring charges, including uh, some synergies with the disposition of inefficient cultivation assets, as well as uh, the um, disposal of a what, duplicate, duplicative location. So, Talk about a word salad, though, eh? All those words put together, my gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, that's going to clear through throughout the year, and we'll get back. And really, I think what's amazing is that we were able to generate $45 million even given that net loss for the quarter. Uh, without that net loss, uh, we would have been at about 78 million uh, cash flow from operations. If you take the first three quarters of 2021, we were at 75 million combined. So really, um, again, really uh, couldn't be happier in terms of our positioning for future growth. 
So I'm just going to stop it there. You can grab the rest of the interview at the link below if you wish. And while I did not say this specifically before, I do plan on buying more shares of TrueLeaf if given the chance. And while I'm working and I'm still saving up now, um, I did mention that I own shares of TrueLeaf, but I did want to add that TrueLeaf is one of the companies that I do plan to average down on once I get the opportunity. And I'm just really hoping that we do keep continuing to see these prices, at least until I get to average down, then I would love to moon at that point. But just wanted to add that for context because I am impressed with these earnings. And for that reason, I will be buying more shares of TrueLeaf hopefully sooner than later. But onto this one, I wanted to share this interview with Cureleaf, uh, Cureleaf Spores. Jordan sees substantial growth in the pot market. And so I just wanted to add this interview uh, to context with what Kim has to say. Uh, just a bit of Boris's, in, or Boris's take on, on, on his most recent earnings with Cureleaf and just the outlook of the cannabis industry going forward. Boris, uh, one of the things that your company, through that scale, operating in so many states, enjoys is the opportunity to grow that lead as more states open up and potentially at a time when you're seeing consolidation or inflation concerns out there perhaps give you a competitive it, uh, edge, how would you characterize what's happening with your business right now? Well, listen, let's take things into perspective. I mean, uh, we grew uh, in 2021 93%. Uh, and uh, if you look at what's happened in the last four years, we've grown from 70 million in revenues to this year, you know, 1.4 to 1.5 billion. And so our first quarter, uh, you know, missed by a couple of percent. That is true. We grew 20 percent year on year, uh, and we were flat to down two percent uh, on the fourth quarter. However, we believe the 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 flatness of of the cannabis market in the U.S. that we saw in the second, third, and fourth quarters of last year uh, is over, and we're going to see uh, substantial growth going into the second, third, and fourth quarters. We're already seeing it. March was a record month for Cureleaf. We had the highest growth rate uh, ever in our in our business, and in April is continuing on that pace. And we anticipate that into the rest of this year, Cureleaf is going to have a very substantial growth year. And so we had a short period of time here for the first uh, for the last three quarters where growth was largely flat because there weren't new catalysts. Right. Now that new catalysts are coming into the market with New Jersey uh, um, uh, launch of adult use, our continued growth in Florida and Illinois, and with New York and Connecticut coming online, and of course Germany uh, in uh, 20, end of 23-24, we anticipate the next two years to be very uh, uh, substantial growth for our business. Boris, you mentioned New Jersey in particular, a key growth area for cannabis sales after uh, making those legal now when it comes to first recreational weed sales. But do you see a shortage in New Jersey, just given the suspected increased demand? Yes, there's no question. So of all the states that I've ever seen in the last eight years convert from medical to adult use, this is the most underserved of all the states in terms of both capacity uh, and uh, retail dispensing locations. And so if you put that into perspective on Illinois, um, which I think had something like 60 uh, dispensaries, we have uh, 13 um, opened up, um, and they had, I think, you know, almost a million uh, square feet of cultivation. I think we have less than 500,000. Uh, and this is a state almost equal in size. And so, yes, it is going to be very underserved for some period of time. But that's actually in good news for Cureleaf because we're the largest operator in the state with an over 30% market share with the largest uh, distribution capability as well as uh, product and cultivation capability. So in the short term, at least, that will play into Cureleaf's hand in the market. And very quickly before we let you go, just to clarify, when there is that tighter market, Boris, I imagine that helps your profit margins in a state like New Jersey? Yes, we anticipate um, uh, you know, gross, uh, 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 gross margins well over 80% and EBITDA margins probably nearing uh, 50 to 55%. So yes, very substantial margin increases in the state during that period of time where the market is still under supply. And we anticipate that to be the case for about two years. So we think that uh, after two years, yes, we'll probably have some more competition, but at least in the next two years, we don't see a lot of competition given the amount of demand that there's gonna be not only from New Jersey, but also from people coming over from Pennsylvania. So just wanted to play this one to the end to add this context about New Jersey as obviously the MSOs that have been approved already to legally supply the demand will benefit and they'll see some added revenue growth to their bottom lines as time goes on. However, only 12 or 13 dispensaries were approved. And so we can only see as much growth as quickly as the CRC approves new dispensaries. And so while that is annoying, hopefully over time, they will continue to expand that as more companies 
least prove that they have the cultivation room available. However, it is worth noting that Cureleaf, I think on their balance sheet, had like 433 million worth of inventory, which is likely cannabis. And so if any of the other MSOs don't have the cultivation space, Cureleaf should you know, take advantage by wholesaling to some of the other MSOs in that state. But bottom line, the more dispensaries that we open up over time, the more sales we'll see. So hopefully the CRC can get their act together. If the pressure's put on them, well, I wanted to share this one from the National Law Review saying what we already know and what we all agree on, Congress should vote or get off the pot. And it's worth noting, I think this is the third or fourth article from the National Law Review this year writing about their support for the Safe Banking Act already. And so clearly they also get that the Safe Banking Act is the next incremental step that actually helps those harmed by the war on drugs because it would give minority entrepreneurs and small businesses access to banking and therefore they could actually start, you know, join this industry, build a business over time sustainably and not be targeted by predatory loans. And so if we scroll down, they reference the, uh, the Hill article that I showed last week as there is momentum for reform, just not Schumer's reform, but the Safe Banking Act is apparently there are now nine Republican co-sponsors of the bill. Um, and so if the Safe Bank Act were to be held in the Senate for a vote today, apparently it does have the votes from both Republicans and Democrats to pass. That is a fact. But Schumer will not hold it for a vote because Schumer works for his own agenda and not for the will of the American people. But not that reform, right, of course, because there's still that double standard towards cannabis. And so just to add, Schumer and other Democrats pushing for pot legalization have said that they'd be open to passing the banking bill if it's coupled with provisions to expunge cannabis convictions and repair damage done for the war on drugs. We've heard this for the last 14 months. But get this, under conference committee rules, lawmakers cannot modify the Safe Banking Act to add additional social equity or criminal justice form reform provisions, complicating its chances of winning Schumer's approval and making it into the final package that goes to President Biden's desk. And so obviously all eyes on Schumer going forward as this bill makes its way through the conference process. And so this is sort of the bad news, but there's a bunch of good news to add after this as the momentum for safe to be added into the final version of the bill is building as well. So we'll get to that, but I wanted to start with the bad before getting to the good. So they say, okay, now what? As they highlight this perfectly, you may be reasonably asking yourself, if the votes in Congress currently exist to pass important common sense cannabis reforms that representatives from both parties believe will make Americans safer, why are the people in charge of deciding whether Congress actually votes on the reforms or not at this moment, allowing these votes to happen? Because they work for their own private agendas and not the will of the American people, sadly. So pay attention and make sure you vote in November. But to add, this is according to the National Law Review. Still, we believe it is worthwhile for Congress and particularly the Senate to get a vote on cannabis reform in the near future. Both parties can benefit from the passage of cannabis reform, particularly the Safe Banking Act. The Democrats can get a win for the cannabis industry. Republicans can say, we are now done with cannabis reform for the time being, and Americans living in states where cannabis is legal under state law, the vast majority of Americans will be safer. But will it happen? We don't know. And as a general rule, we prefer not to bet on Congress making well-considered decisions in a timely manner. Gun to head, according to the National Law Review, we do not believe Congress will pass meaningful cannabis reform before January. But that is just their opinion. And so again, we don't know what will happen. So plan accordingly and plan for the worst, but expect to be pleasantly surprised at some point, as that is how you play this industry. But the good news uh, to bounce off of that is this from Tom Angle as of Thursday. Thursday, May 12th. New, nearly a quarter of the U.S. Senate, 19 Democrats and five Republicans, and this is the Senate, not the House, are joining together to push congressional leaders to finally enact cannabis banking provisions through the America Competes Act, which has its first conference meeting today. Well, this looks like more of the same. I do think this is a very big deal because we see that 19 members of the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, so this is a bipartisan effort, are doing their best to force Schumer and Booker's hands to keep safe in the final version. If we scroll down, we see another letter sent, this one from 24 Democrats and GOP senators, highlighting all truths enacting the Safe Banking Act would support a rapidly growing industry that creates jobs and certainly does more to give back to those harmed by the war on drugs by any other industry by far, regardless of what Schumer and Booker want to say. Second, fosters innovation, supports small businesses and raises revenue in states that have chosen to legalize cannabis while reducing safety risks. All true, and this comes as of Thursday morning and then Thursday midday we get this from Tom Angles. Thank you, Tom. Today, at the first meeting of the America Competes Act Conference Committee, several members discussed the need to include cannabis banking provisions in the final bill, as Rep. Blumenauer called Safe Banking a matter of life and death, which is true because if dispensaries are not forced to operate in cash, they will not be targeted for robberies and will not see many industry workers die because they work at dispensaries that are targeted by criminals because they work in cash only. And that's exactly what safe fixes. So again, mind blowing that the two that have the ability to make this happen want to stand in the way. But again, that's because they work for their own personal agendas um, and their campaign donors and not for the will of the American people. But just to add on top of Rep. Blumenauer, third ranking Democrat Sen Senator Patty Murray today, keeping Safe Banking Act in will ensure cannabis stores in states like mine do not have to operate entirely in cash. And this is a really straightforward bipartisan solution to a real public safety threat. And that absolutely is. And so obviously the more people that vocalize their support, 
the better. And if Schumer were to pull this out of the final version of the American America Competes Act, that is just simply not a good look, especially for him going into an election. So I think that's why this time around could be different from the NDAA, but it might not. So make sure you plan accordingly for your own situation. Well, I wanted to add this one from Natalie Fertig as the Florida Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed joins in the safe banking melee, just expressing her support. So I'm not sure that this is going to make much of an impact, but Commissioner Nikki Freed calls on Florida congressional members to keep cannabis banking provisions in America Competes Act. And so obviously, and the more support we have, the better. Well, I wanted to share this one from Todd Harrison, sharing what Isaac Boltanski has to say on U.S. cannabis about cannabis trade policy as the China Competitiveness Conference underway with a push for cannabis banking policy. And so if you want to get more out of this, you can pause to read. Otherwise, you can grab the link below. And so I just find this funny. There is no doubt in our mind that the conference committee will produce a reconciled bill. Obviously, that's the point of the conference committee. It has to produce a reconciled bill. But nonetheless, um, I don't think it's going to take months. It could take months, but we're just going to have to wait and see. And so on to news from some MSOs, as Air Wellness announces, we're happy to share that our res we've received our final license to open our Air Back Bay adult store in Boston. And so this is the first adult use dispensary in the neighborhood and Air's first adult use dispensary in Massachusetts. So good job, Air Wellness, for expanding your footprint in Massachusetts. Well, as of yesterday, Columbia Care is happy to announce that they've launched their first cannabis-infused hot sauce in the state of Delaware now available in red hot and coastal crab flavors. So this is a very interesting product. And while I've never tried a cannabis infused hot sauce, I would like to try it, but I don't think I'd like to get into the habit of buying cannabis infused hot sauce in order to consume with my cannabis infused flour. But what about you? Would you buy some of this? Let me know in the comments. And so lastly, wanted to share that MedMen and Ascend Wellness Holdings have come to an agreement, uh, I believe, and resolved their litigation as MedMen to sell New York operations for 88 million, adding 15 million in incremental value. And so from my understanding, the transaction resolves the litigation between MedMen and Ascend Wellness Holdings concerning the transaction and delivers an added 15 million in additional value to MedMen shareholders. Now, I don't know exactly how many assets MedMen had in New York, but this seems like quite a deal to get New York operations and licenses, even if it's one dispensary, for just 88 million. And so I wanted to share this because in my eyes, this makes Ascend Wellness Holdings a very attractive asset or very attractive M&A target for New York assets, something that truly might want to consider down the line. And while I do imagine that the settlement does benefit both companies, it seems like Ascend Wellness Holdings definitely got the better end of the deal for New York assets for just 88 million in here. And so on to some state news, wanted to share this one from Puff Daddy. And while this isn't really news, it's more like a rumor because it doesn't say that they will actually, it's more to be expected. It is in line with what we've heard from regulators in the past saying that they want to try and approve some small minority entrepreneurs and small business licenses before MSOs to start adult use by the end of this year, and then allow all the MSOs and adult use to launch by 2023 and the rest of the businesses. And so again, while this isn't set news, it's just more in line with what we've heard from regulators sharing that 100 to 200 New York businesses are expected to be able to legally sell cannabis by the end of 2022. And so obviously many things can happen to stop this from happening. But if you wanted to read more about this article, you can grab the link below. So that is positive news for New York. It means that they're likely on pace in order to allow this to happen. Um, also wanted to share this one from Tom Angle as this is big news out of California as Governor Gavin Newsom issued an updated budget proposal that would eliminate the state's cannabis cultivation tax in an attempt to help legal licensed businesses better compete in the illicit market. Well, this is like maybe two weeks late because in my last video I did report how so many of the smaller growers have been affected by the taxes and for that reason they've either had to just stop completely sell their licenses for discounts or come together um, and you know and work with what they've got left this will obviously help all of the growers in California but more importantly I think it will help the MSOs that haven't had to scrounge sell off assets um, you know, and merge with other small growers just because if they didn't, they'd be completely run out by the illegal market. So regardless, this is a great step in the right direction for California. Um, and it's just, it just, it sucks that it's coming late because obviously I think a lot of the brunt ha has been faced already by small business owners. It is just good news for the MSOs operating in that state as they will not have to pay cultivation tax anymore. Well, breaking news as of Thursday though, so not breaking anymore, but the Delaware Senate just sent a bill to legalize cannabis possession to Governor John Carney. While separate legislation to regulate adult use sales and launch an adult use program is also advancing, but I don't think this one was sent to his desk yet. And so this would just effect effectively decriminalize cannabis so that no one in Delaware would go to jail for possession. And so that is obviously a small win for those in Delaware. But to add to this, apparently Carney is a rare Democrat Democratic governor who opposes legalization so not clear what he'll do. But anyways, a decriminalization effort is heading to the desk of the governor of Delaware. And so hopefully he can sign that. While not all state news is great news, as unfortunately an Ohio lawsuit settlement puts legalization activists on path for 2023. So thanks, Todd, for sharing this. And while we were hopeful that they would get it done, apparently an initiative to legalize cannabis will not appear on Ohio's November ballot, but activists look forward. And so just to recap, though, while we were anticipating that Ohio could make it on, we already have Maryland uh, for sure that will have that question on the 2022 ballot. And we are looking at Pennsylvania and Missouri as activists are currently trying to get that on the ballot as well. And so 
Come November 2022, I do think cannabis will still be a big winner uh, come election time, but sadly, we'll just have to wait for Ohio to come later in 2023. It's worth knowing that Ohio does have a successful and rapidly growing medical cannabis program right now. And so while this does get pushed back, adult use legalization in Ohio is an inevitability. And so hopefully that will happen sooner than later. Well, unfortunately, this one does come from Tom Engel as well. South Carolina Senate leadership rejected an effort to revive medical cannabis legislation by attaching it to a largely unrelated bill. So take a bill you don't like, attach it to another bigger bill that you're not going to pass, and just let it float there while sadly 100,000 Americans did die of opioids last year. It's like they don't even notice or they don't even care. Sadly, this defeat comes a week after House leaders similarly blocked medical cannabis on procedural grounds. And so not all states are made equal. If I was in South Carolina, I would do my best to save up and get out of there as quickly as possible. While this one comes from Tom Engel, as apparently the National Institute on Drug Abuse Director Nora Valko was pressed about cannabis, kratom, and drug decriminalization at a House hearing, with several lawmakers appearing to admit that cannabis legalization is inevitable, despite their own concerns. And regardless of their concerns, it's just based on old fear and beliefs that aren't true. And they need to look at the new data to prove that this is actually a solution to so many of the U.S.'s problems. And the sooner that they would do it, the sooner that the U.S. would flourish. But it almost seems like those in power don't want the U.S. to flourish right now, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but I'm not in their heads. And so lastly, wanted to share some international news as Todd Harrison highlights, London Drugs Commission looks to illegalize to probably legalize cannabis is likely a typo. So my bad there, but Mr. Khan, who is apparently the mayor of London, uh, described his visit to a cannabis dispensary in the U.S. state of California as fascinating. Yeah, join the times in 2022, bud. It's, you know, not that hard. Just end prohibition. And lastly, wanted to share is Thailand to give away 1 million free cannabis plants to households. A minister says, letting it's a great time to be a Thai citizen as the Thai government will distribute 1 million free cannabis plants to households across the nation in June to mark a new rule allowing people to grow cannabis at home, its health minister has said. And the new rule, which comes into force on June 9th, will allow people to grow cannabis plants at home after notifying their local governments, but the plants will have to be of medical grade and used exclusively for medicinal purposes. And for this reason, it does make me think they're referring to the hemp plant specifically, because that's high in CBD, versus the cannabis plant, which is high in THC, if we were to get specific. So I'm not sure exactly which they're referring to, but still step in the right direction. As additionally, the cannabis cannot be used for commercial purposes without further licenses. And so while you can't sell it to all your neighbors, you won't have to because they'll likely get their own plant. Regardless, this is a great news for Thailand and a step in the right direction after the Thai government deemed that cannabis was a medicine and did not belong in its list of controlled substances. Therefore, they removed it earlier this year. And the U.S. would benefit greatly from taking a page from their book and doing the same thing. Because if you just deschedule cannabis and change the status from illegal to legal, it solves so many domestic issues issues, and it would make the lives of many Americans better in many ways that they hadn't even realized yet. And that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Wednesday. Have a great weekend, everybody.